Um, so let's see, Here is my stuff. Okay, um, so we are starting with the machine learning and deep learning. I'm just wanna, gonna, uh, is there a hand up right now? I don't know if it's a question, but you can just type in the chat and I'll check. Um, so I'm just, I, I just wanna like set the expectations here. What are we going to do here with machine learning and deep learning? Um, so we, we, we will see what kind of modules are available with us in all these HPCs. Um, we will try to run some Python applications using these modules. We will also try to run some uh, machine learning and deep learning applications without these modules, so using environments. We will also run these, of course, on CPUs. Um, we will then, uh, of course, so this is not about actually understanding what's in the code. Uh, I've taken very simple hello world kind of codes, which is very basic for machine learning and deep learning applications, like the beginner level. Um, this is also not going to talk about how to deploy your application in multi-node setup. Uh, but if you have like one node and you have multiple GPUs, you're good to go. So for these like uh, advanced usages where you, you need to understand how to deploy with multi-node and everything, I would encourage you to reach out to your uh, HPC uh, application experts and they would actually know how to do it because in that level, it's usually that's the, the slurm comes into play and how it in, how your code interacts with the slurm comes into play. So it varies from place to place. So we will not talk about that. Um, so I'll just show what's there with us today. Um, I'll start with some introduction about the three main highly used uh, machine learning and deep learning um, applications, scikit-learn, PyTorch, and TensorFlow. Give you some comparison uh, for those who have not heard about it or is the first time and they just want to get started with it. Um, and then, I will start by giving you this table, which you see here, which says what kind of uh, library is available in what HPC resource and where can you find it. I'll then talk about scikit-learn, starting with machine learning stuff. Then I'll move on to PyTorch and TensorFlow. I'll take PyTorch and TensorFlow together, reason being, Researchers are either using PyTorch or TensorFlow at a the time. They're not using both at the time. And uh, so I, I thought like I can create something which is people who want to use PyTorch code, they'll run that. If, if they want to use TensorFlow code, they'll run that. So I'm going to talk about these two together. Um, and then we'll end with the, some question like exercises. So this, this is going to be hands-on. Um, so I would request every one of you to be on your resources um at least log in now and then we'll do some stuff with it um i have given some links here and there which talks about the for example scikit learn you can read more about them you can also read some uh, something about um uh, some some learning material here um which has like some useful links that that's that's for like beginners and advanced users both. Um, I have also given what kind of modules should be loaded to load TensorFlow and PyTorch. So you'll find these scattered here and there. But the motivation of this is to actually now, you, this is like the end of all the talks and all the whole two-day workshop. And by now, I think everyone is like an expert now how to run slum jobs, how to how to uh, start their environments, how to you know deploy parallel code, so I'm gonna take a quiz now. You know, I'm just joking. We're not having quizzes. Um, who takes quizzes? Um, but then the expectation from you would be that you at least understand how to run, let's say, environment, and just uh, start your Jupyter uh, notebook and run your code there. So th th this will be like assumed that you know now. Machine learning and deep learning. So. Um, Just gonna keep time here. Okay, um, so starting with 
let's say a little bit of introduction. What do we have in machine learning, deep learning libraries? We have these three major ones, um, scikit-learn, PyTorch, and TensorFlow. Those who know it, well and good. Those who don't, well, scikit-learn is quite an old one. I started with scikit-learn long ago. Um, it's a very, very traditional kind of machine learning applications and uh, libraries and toolkits on scikit-learn uh, for data mining cases, uh, for statistical machine learning cases. Uh, very, very useful, very lightweight as well. So this is what scikit-learn give, uh, gives. Uh, compared with PyTorch and TensorFlow, these are mainly for developing deep learning applications. Uh, TensorFlow used to be like a leader in its uh, in this long ago. Uh, Tiano with Keras, um, PyTorch came into being, and it had a motto that you know we're gonna make everything very simple to use, and that's that was their motto. And quickly it was adopted, especially in academia, it was adopted very quickly, um, and then to well, industry always copies. So, uh, so that that happened, and uh, so te so TensorFlow came into being, but it's like slowly deteriorating. PyTorch is still picking up, and it is releasing a lot of stuff, especially with LLM stuff, uh, LLM libraries, and how to handle them, create chatbots uh, very quickly, and all those things. So it's easy to well comparatively easy to learn than TensorFlow uh, in some cases. But TensorFlow, what it gives is sometimes very good APIs for deploying your machine learning, deep learning applications on, let's say, edge devices or devices like lo local devices, uh, which are not connected to internet or something like that. So it can be highly customized for those use cases. So maybe people who are in IoT, um, Thingy, they, they might be using TensorFlow more than they, they might be using PyTorch. Um, I personally like PyTorch. I used to use TensorFlow. I used to use Tiano and Keras. Keras was sort of the grandfather of TensorFlow at a time, but now TensorFlow uses Keras as its backend to uh, run neural networks. Tiano is gone now. Um, like a lot of other Google stuff, you know, like Google Lens. <laughs> um, yeah, so PyTorch and TensorFlow, yeah. Um, Scikit-learn has a really good document. Actually, all three of them have very good documentation. Uh, PyTorch, I, li I like it a lot because recently it's uh, in boom. Um, Scikit-learn is traditional stuff, so it has really good documentation. Um, and uh, yeah, PyTorch and TensorFlow, of course, is uses GPU um, extensively. GPU it also uses distributed in a distributed fashion, uh, highly customizable in that case. Scikit-learn doesn't much. Right? Well, it does sort of. We'll see how, um, but not the way that these two do. Okay. Moving on. Um, so I'll start with Scikit-learn here. Before moving to actually the, there, I'll just show these this this part of the whole documentation. This is just mentioning about the modules that you can load. So at Max stuff is lying inside Python ML packages. HPC2 and TensorFlow PyTorch, this and this needs to be loaded. I was not going to give this before. I was like, I'll, I'll let you guys figure out where is it. But it's a, a, even I was struggling a little bit to be honest. So I thought like, okay, I, I need to get this. Um, so this is already given now. Um, I've already also given some learning material. These are very easy examples. You can understand like the basics of PyTorch, TensorFlow, machine learning stuff. A little bit of advance because someone was asking uh, the re reinforcement learning gym library. Um, so I thought I should give this link as well, uh, how to do data parallelism with PyTorch, uh, distributed training with TensorFlow. Uh, they have some interesting stuff there. If whether it can be run on your HPC or not, you have to see because a, as I was saying, multi-node deployments a, is not straightforward. Um, memories are not shared as Bjorn was also mentioning. Um, so data has to be copied on every node. 
sort of beats the purpose if the data is huge. Mm, scikit-learn has some parallelism, we'll see, but we won't perform it uh, because again, there are some restrictions on how it parallelizes. By the way, it can also use Dask as we saw earlier. Um, we'll see how it uses, we won't use it. And everyone wants to hyperparameter tune their models. And I've seen codes which run like for days and days and takes all the GPUs. So do it properly. Use some good APIs for that. Uh, Ray cluster is a good one. We are not covering that. It's it's an advanced section, okay. Um, so Ray cluster is good with that. Dask also do, does that, but how, Dask is used like a backend with other APIs. Um, so like, for example, scikit-learn uses task as its backend to parallelize stuff. We, we won't touch that, but it's, the links are here. All right. This table is important for subsequent exercises because whenever I say use, let's say scikit-learn, you will see, okay, I'm on Lunark, scikit-learn is here. You will do ML Spider Scikit Learn to Module Spider ML. Now you should know ML means is a shorthand of module. Uh, do M Module Spider Scikit Learn. You'll see a list of versions. Choose the version you want. Um, this is for three point three point eleven point three and three point eleven point five. So th these will work with this Python version. All these will. This this column will work with this Python version. Similarly, all this will work with this Python version. NSC doesn't have Tetralli doesn't have stuff in it, but that doesn't mean you should. Uh, okay, I've given alternatives how to run stuff on NSC, uh, which I should remind myself how to uh, do it. I, I'll just show you how. Um, but this table is useful whenever I say do this, do that. You'll you'll have to look up and just get an idea. Okay, this is where it lies. Um. Okay, scikit learn. Well, scikit learn, uh, as I was saying, very basic machine learning, not very basic, but very useful stuff as well with machine learning, statistical and deep data mining um, uh, algorithms implemented in scikit-learn. It uses NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, uh, and it's like backend. Uh, so it's like super helpful um, to quickly make a model check, for example, do classification with it, draw some graphs with it, well and good, looks good in proof of concept. Now let's build a robust model. Of course, it comes with, um, Hyperparameter tuning, uh, grid search CV, randomized CV. There are other versions of it as well. You use them, then you make a more, more robust model. Um, so I have given a link, sort of drop down here of what scikit-learn contains. I'm not going through all of these. This is just for showing the main components of scikit-learn. Estimators, transformers, pipelines, data sets, model evaluations, parameter searches. These are a few. And I've given what, what it means and what's the example of these, a few examples of these. I think the most important ones everyone would anyway use for, for, for example, are estimators, of course, estimators are the model itself, the algorithm itself. So for example, linear regression model, KNN, decision trees, the algorithm itself is called estimators, and it comes with a nice function called fit, which means fit the data set. That's all it means. So basically, fit means learn from the data set. Transformers is not the transformers in your NLP language, uh, kind of, but transformers here mean pre process the data set. And it comes with fit and transform. So it includes, you know, okay, learn from the data and transform it in some way. What kind of transformation? Depends on what library, sorry, what 
a method you're using, a class you're using, standard scalar, PCA, TFIDF, a lot of, lot of time this is used for to vectorize text. Um, so transformers means uh, pre-process your data and there are nice classes for it. Pipelines is quite popular nowadays to use pipelines every every in every big API. Python API pipeline basically means to you know, make a proper workflow of your whole stuff. Um, so you can like stack things. So you know the pipeline. My headset went off. My headset went off. Uh, Beyond, can you help me, hear me? Let me know. Um, hear you. Oh, thank you. So pipelines means that um, stacking your pre-process stuff, transformers together, your estimators together. It helps in a way that, you know, you don't want to buy mistake in a whole huge chunk of code, um, fit the data on a test set, for example. Well, that's a bad machine learning practice, okay? Already fitting the data on your test set or uh, held out set, which is not good. Data sets is basically library with a uh, lot of ready-made data sets for you to just quickly test things. Iris, digits, things like that. Model evaluation and parameter search is, I think, very popular. They're so popular that they are sometimes used in tandem with PyTorch or TensorFlow. So you'll see PyTorch TensorFlow code, and people will use model evaluation and parameter searches from scikit-learn there. And this is uh, good because, for example, you can like, of course, for example, you're, you have a split of training data set and testing, you uh, apply some estimator on it, you fit your data set on it, you do some predictions on it. Now you need to what evaluate it, right? So it comes with a lot of different kinds of evaluation matrices. Accuracy um, is, for example, one of them, it's already used here. But there are other kinds of evaluations that you can do. Uh, mean square error, um, different kinds of scores. You can calculate an atom score, things like that. So it comes handy with other APIs as well. TensorFlow, PyTorch also uses this sometimes. Parameter searches, I uh, think one of the favorites of um, whoever uses scikit-learn. Because here, instead of giving um, different running your same code again and again for different parameters, you can bind them together in a class and run it them with some logic. Uh, grid search CV is quite uh, popular again. It's like a list of parameters you have, you run it with everything. I have a list of parameters, just run my, fit my model, run it, evaluate it with all these different uh, parameters, you know. Randomized search CV is a little bit more interesting in the way that um, do a search of your parameter hyperspace, but at least understand the distribution of the data first, and then only search in those areas of your uh, data distribution that are actually giving good results, not just everywhere else. So there are some good uh, classes there. Um, I'm using some examples there just to run them and show them that they execute. I'm not going through them, but this is for linear regression, the yeah, and decision tree, very simple. Coming up is an exercise I want all of you to do. So you can already start reading it. Um, and let me tell you what it is first, then I'll run this one. Where's my, yeah. So this is a Titanic uh, machine learning from design. This is a very basic Kegel kind of uh, code um, competition, uh, which sort of predicts how many people survived, how many people died on the Titanic crash. Um, when you uh, git clone this repository that you did, you will find a, a IPy notebook already called Titanic SKLearn. 
and it should be in the this directory. Not given the name. Exercises, examples, programs. In this directory, when you get clone, you'll find this one. You just need to run it. Um, even if you don't understand the code, it's totally fine. But running this way, uh, you just need a CPU node. You don't need to have a GPU for this. Run it in a Jupyter notebook. Okay, so the Jupyter notebook should be used in an interactive fashion. Well, if you're an HPC to win, then it's submitted as a batch job. You already know you did it yesterday. Uh, but run this code on a Jupyter notebook on a simple CPU node. You don't need a GPU for this. Um, but when you do get this Jupyter notebook, before running the Jupyter notebook, of course, you will have to correctly load the modules, right? So look at this code. What does it need? A NumPy, Pandas, Seaborn, Matplotlib. We have already covered these things. Uh, but now you need to import them in a proper, correctly uh, module load them. So module load all of these. You will also, of course, module load Jupyter. That's how you'll start Jupyter. First module load these, module load Jupyter, run Jupyter notebook on a CPU node. Uh, and execute this IPy notebook. That's all, you can already start. Um, we'll have a pause. I'll give like 15 minutes. Uh, we'll all have to try this. Um, for NSC users, if there are any, I have pre-built this environment because you don't have all these. I pre-built this environment and uh, I've created two environments. One is for the TensorFlow environment, one is for the PyTorch environment. Run whatever. Uh, you already know how to run a virtual environment now. You know, source, name, bin, activate. Run these, and then you can start your Jupyter notebook. Um, so whoever wants to start this, you can start it now, 15 minutes from now. I'll put a timer. Meanwhile, I will run just this simple code here, just to show that uh, I am running NumPy, Matplotlib, and scikit-learn somewhere. Can can I get like a some some sort of emoji just to see who all are trying to run this? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. So the whole purpose of this is to know how to load the correct modules and all the scikit-learn, NumPy, Seaborn, Jupyter, and the Jupyter, and a Pi, IPy notebook. This is the main basic idea of this whole exercise, not to understand the code itself, but you can, of course, go through the code and understand it if you want to. Uh, it, it looks like this, Titan Eskila. If anyone has a question, they can ask a question so that everyone else can also hear or understand the answer. 